Hey guys! To kick off this year, I thought that we could do something a little bit different from what we usually do, and instead of reviewing one book, I wanted to talk about all the books I read last year. Since there are quite a few of them, I will try to keep my thoughts short and to the point, as well as I will try to avoid any spoilers. So buckle up, we're going to be here for a while. So let's start this video with thrillers, arguably the easiest category to talk about, and that's because I have already made full-on reviews on most of these books. Sharp Objects by Gillian Flynn, Notes on an Execution by Dania Kukavka, and The Guest List by Lucy Foley. We're all amazing crime thrillers, each in their own right. I have already made the reviews on Notes on an Execution and The Guest List, but I am currently working on a full flushed review for Sharp Objects as well, as all these books are definitely worth your attention. Sharp Objects is a roller coaster of a book. It features a protagonist that no one is really willing to root for, as well as a disturbingly toxic family dynamic. Gillian Flynn has a talent for writing difficult stories about difficult people that you simply can't put down, and Sharp Objects is not an exception. It features features an intriguing storyline and multiple plot twists that leave you questioning everything you thought you knew. Notes on an Execution might have just been the best thriller I have read last year, and that's mostly because it was not like anything I have read before. Notes on an Execution is one of a kind. It's the type of book that I will never get tired of recommending to people, and that's because it has it all. It has this narcissistic sociopathic serial killer, full-fledged storyline, and multi-dimensional characters with their own realistic motivations for doing things they do and behaving the way they behave. This fictional book is so well-written that reading it you can't help but feel like you are reading an actual true crime story. What's even better, the story is structured in a way which gives a voice to the women who are not directly involved in the crimes committed, yet whose lives are in one way or another drastically influenced by the serial killer. This novel portrays perfectly how interconnected we all are and how one decision can have an unpredictable amount of consequences. Meanwhile, The Guest List is the closest thing I have found to Agatha Christie novels. It's a perfect example on how to write an intriguing whodunit style novel. It features a wide cast of characters and it keeps you on the edge of your seat as for the longest time you are left guessing not only who is our killer but also who is our victim. Rock, Paper, Scissors by Alice Feeney and The Burning Girls by C.J. Tudor, both mystery thrillers, are another two wonderful books that I just can't recommend enough. Rock, Paper, Scissors features a married couple who decides to take a weekend off in a remote location and try to rekindle their relationship. However, from the very first page, you get this nagging feeling that something here is just not quite right. Rock, Paper, Scissors is one of these books where you feel like the more you read, the less you want to root for any of the characters, as all of them start to seem borderline psychotic. It's an amazing book with an unpredictable end, and if you are a fan of mystery thrillers, this book should definitely be on your TBR. As for The Burning Girls, I have already sung a lot of praises to it in my full review video, but to keep it short, in this novel we follow a Reverend Jack who is being sent to a remote village with a small tight-knitted community and a lot of secrets. The Burning Girls has a perfect mixture of supernatural elements and realistic crime story. It explores a variety of topics such as religion, mental illness, and small town politics while staying thoroughly entertaining. Now, if you have watched some of my videos before, you might know that Stephen King is one of my all-time favorite authors. Now what you probably don't know is that he has earned this title only rather recently. Like any other I knew of Stephen King, it's impossible not to. But for the longest time I didn't feel like giving him a try. Can't even explain to you why now. But then I was waiting for a plane, being bored, and ended up uh, seeing that The Shining by Stephen King is on a pretty friendly discount in an airport's bookstore. So I gave it a try and, well, I guess you could call this a love from the first page. My current mission in life is to read and own all the books written by Stephen King. So it will not come as a surprise that all five horror books that I've read last year were written by him. Carrie and The Pet Cemetery are both horror classics with multiple movie adaptations, 
and despite the fact that I knew exactly what will happen in both of them, I still enjoyed every moment of it. Jerusalem Slot in just 40 pages delivered me a more captivating story than some authors managed to deliver by writing full-on trilogies, as well as it pushed the Salem Slot to the top of my TBR for this year. I just need to get more of King's vampire action. Now, Gwendy's Button Box, a story that Stephen King has co-written with Richard Chismar, as well as the first part of the book trilogy by the same name, was honestly a bit of a miss for me. I got very intrigued by the premise of the story of a girl who was given a little wooden box from a complete stranger for safekeeping. A box that regularly rewards its owner with different gifts, treats, and coins, making the little girl's life significantly better. Yet at the same time, when treated without caution, the box can and cause death and destruction. So as I said, the premise for a great novel was there, but the story itself seemed a little lacking to me. It felt a little too light and too simple to be King's book, or a horror novel for that matter. I guess I just need to give the other two books in the trilogy a try to get the full picture. But as a standalone book, I can't say that it left much of an impression on me. And lastly, we have The Long Walk. Now, this novel was definitely among the top five books I have read last year. It's a very straightforward story about a hundred boys who volunteer to participate in a race of a sort, where they all need to walk, keeping a steady pace without ever stopping. If they stop, they die. And the race only ends when there is only one boy walking. I remember explaining the premise of this novel to my boyfriend and him being confused about it. He looked at me and asked, so what, they just gonna walk the whole book? And yeah, that's exactly what happened. They just walked the whole book. And that's a testament to Stephen King's ability to write that a novel where the whole action happens on a road, following the boy's inner demons while they walk stuck with me so much. Overall, I said it before and I will say it again every time I talk about Stephen King, is that he, like no other, manages to combine the supernatural horror with a mundane life. The best part of every book he has written is the people. He has a natural talent for immersing you in the story and for forcing you to live in it, to get down and dirty and see how humans are always worse than any supernatural horror you can imagine. All right, let's move to the fantasy genre. And let's kick this off with The Ninth House by Lea Bardugo. The moment I heard that Lea Bardugo is publishing a mystery slash horror slash crime slash fantasy novel for adults, I knew I needed to read it. Six of Crows was a book that reminded me just how much I love fantasy, and now getting something written by her for an actual adult audience seemed like a dream come true. So I bought it and started reading it, and honestly, quite some time had to pass before I started enjoying it. So the book follows a young woman named Alex, and let's say she didn't have the most wholesome upbringing. Early in life, Alex got mixed up with a bad crowd, which led her into the life of crime and drugs. After the things got seriously sideways, and Alex became the only survivor of horrific multiple homicide, she is given a second chance. A possibility to enroll into Yale, with a contingency that she will help to keep Yale's secret societies and their activities in check. The novel has a very convoluted and interesting lore. It doesn't shy from difficult topics, and all through the book you can feel that the stakes are high. At the same time, Ninth House is not very easy to read. If anything, at least the first half of it is very confusing. It jumps from one time point to another, it doesn't have any characters that I would consider likable, and it takes a little too long before it starts giving us any actual explanations on what is going on. Weirdly enough, reading the first half of the book, I couldn't shake the feeling that I might have missed a prologue or a short story which would make this one more understandable. That being said, I have no doubts that I will give a second book in the Alex Stern series a try. The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller is a fantastic novel that I can't recommend enough. It's masterfully written, it has fascinating storyline and characters that you learn to love even when you don't support their decisions. It's the kind of book that I truly believe everyone should read at least once in their lifetime. The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern was probably the most beautiful novel I've read last year. Its storyline can be difficult to explain in a few sentences, but I have made a full video review on it if you want to check it out. 
Well, The Night Circus is not the type of book that would immerse you and push you to binge read it through the night. It is a book that stuck with me. The characters, the storyline, the atmosphere, all of that felt like a weird fairy tale I do not wish to leave. It was simply magical. When it comes to The Smile and the Lines by Chloe Gong, I am a little bit torn. These Violent Delights, in case you do not know, is an imaginative retelling of Romeo and Juliet set in 1920s Shanghai. It's the first book in a duology and I have a bit of a bone to pick with that. These Violent Delights is honestly pretty great. The characters are interesting and multidimensional. The decision to set it into early 20th century allows the author to play with the ideas of globalization and cultural appropriation, as well as the fantasy angle in a story that is universally known, turns this into a very different read than the original. It's written for a young adult audience, so while the simplicity of it is easily understandable, it also made a lot of mistakes that a good fantasy novel like this should not have had a right to make. And these small mistakes kept on piling up, taking the whole reading experience down. To be honest with you, despite These Violent Delights being the second book I read in 2022, I still haven't made up my mind on whether I will give Our Violent Ends a try or not. The next fantasy book I read I can unfortunately recommend only to a very small portion of mankind, and that's because it's a Lithuanian classic. Baltara Gemoluna's by Kaziz Borota, in which we follow a man who makes a deal with the devil. He wants a woman whom he wholeheartedly loves to marry him, and in return he promises his firstborn daughter to the devil as his bride. But since it is not translated into English, you need to know Lithuanian or any of these languages to read it. Sorry. That being said, let's move to Sarah J. Mass. I have started on the Throne of Glass series in the end of 2021, and in the beginning of 2022, I have wrapped up the rest of it by reading The Empire of Storms, Tower of Dawn, and Kingdom of Ash. I will not spend a lot of time dissecting these books right now, as I have already made video reviews of each of them, well, except the Kingdom of Ash, but that's coming at some point too. Overall, I can say that I do appreciate the world Sarah J. Maas has created. And while the last few books might have included a little too much romance for my personal taste, as well as I don't always understand the author's need to make sure that every of her characters has a happy ending by finding a romantic partner, I did enjoy reading the series. They're easily bingeable, they put you into a weird state of uh, trance where all you can do is read, live and breathe Throne of Glass, and it does have multiple very well written emotional moments that stayed with me long after the books were done. What else can I say? I am a fan. And then one day, I decided for some reason to give A Touch of Darkness, a first part of the Hades and Persephone series by Scarlett Sinclair, a try. So I read it, and while reading it, I realized that this same book has already been rewritten to show us the story from Hades POV. So naturally, as soon as I finished A Touch of Darkness, I grabbed a game of fate. And the weirdest thing happened. While reading a game of fate, I could feel my brain putting two mediocre books together and combining them into one pretty decent novel. I honestly think that Scarlett Sinclair made a mistake by releasing two different books instead of adding a hundred pages into one of them, combining it to include both Hades and Persephone's POVs. A Touch of Darkness by itself is pretty boring. You follow a girl who is a god, yet since she doesn't have her powers, you spend quite a lot of time observing her doing mundane things, like working. At the same time, A Touch of Darkness does a pretty bad job at flushing Hades out as a character. Meanwhile, A Game of Fate fixes these mistakes by giving us a novel which is rich in lore, giving us a god who is very much involved in all of the riveting action. At the same time, if I would have read only A Game of Fate, I would have not understood Persephone or her struggles with her mother or self-image at all. As I said, these two books should have been one, and nobody can change my mind about that. Alright, now that we're done with fantasy, let's proceed to romance. I gotta point out that for the longest time, crime and horror have been my two to-go genres. Yet somehow, during 2021, I found a new appreciation for romance novels, and well, to celebrate my newfound love for love, last year I have read basically any romance novel I could get my hands on. Therefore, let me apologize in advance for the amount of stupid books I'm about to subject you to. You know what? Maybe let's actually start with my pick for the worst romance novels I have read last year, just to be done with it. 
Carnage by Sarah Bailey, Rivers Haram, and the first novel in the Four Horsemen series. I'm just not gonna say anything about it anymore. <laughs> I have made a full video review on it already, and the book is just bad. Let's leave it at that. Very bad. Man Card by Serena Bowen and Tanya Abbey, Enemies to Lovers Story, and a second book in the Manhattan series. I have skipped the first one, so I don't know anything about it, and I'm sure as hell not gonna read anything else from this series. This book is very stupid. It's supposed to be enemies to lovers, but it's not. The main male character is supposed to be some sort of feminist icon, a man who truly defies toxic masculinity, but he just comes off as very obnoxious, though the main female lead is just as insufferable as he, so I guess they do make a pretty good couple. And the main conflict of the novel is based on something so incredibly stupid that even I was lost for words. Then we have Marriage for One by Ella Macy. So, moment of truth. I picked this book to read because its cover reminded me of Sam Hugan. The novel itself was very bad and way too long, as well as it tried to surprise us by switching up the lanes and trying to introduce us to some heavier drama plot points that just didn't work at all. It's just a type of a book that isn't worth your time. So, lesson learned. Next time I'll see someone looking like Sam, I'll just rewatch Outlander instead. Another contender for the worst romance novel I read in 2022 is Misadventures of a Curvy Girl by Sarah Simone. I am a curvy girl, and Sarah Simone wrote The Priest, which was pretty hot, so I thought, why not? Let's give it a try. I shouldn't have. There is nothing good about this novel. Characters are annoying more often than not, the three-way insta-love comes completely out of nowhere, storyline is basically non-existent, and the main conflict could have been solved, and it is solved with a two-minute conversation. And lastly, we have Fight or Flight by Samantha Young, which admittedly is the best written book among these worst romance novels, but at the same time, the book made me beyond mad. The writing style of Samantha Young is generally pretty clever, and the book is entertaining enough, but the messages presented in this novel just suck. Now that we're done with the worst romance novels, let's move to the smut category. Now these are the novels that I picked to read knowing that they're gonna be real shitty, but hoping that they might also be pretty hot, and hey, it's never too late to discover new kings. So, Ladies, Men and Heartbreaker, both by Ella Kennedy, are novels 9 and 7 respectively in the Out of Uniform series. Ladies, Men follow Claire, a bride left by her future husband on the day of their wedding. The groom's brother, Dylan, is the one left to deal with the consequences of this decision. And while Dylan might not be a fan of Claire, he's also not the type of a man to leave her without a place to stay. So he takes her home, where he already lives with his eye candy slash lover, Aiden. And Heartbreaker is the story of Jen and Cash, two people who met in a bar and share an instant attraction only to learn that Jen is a girl, Cash, a Navy SEAL, is being tasked with protecting, making Jen completely out of limits. Then we have Follow by Tessa Bailey, in which Teresa, in order to save her brother from a very dangerous situation, has to find a way to convince a stranger to drop his plans and come back to New York with her. Sparks fly, and despite Teresa starting this whole mess under false pretenses, she slowly realizes that what she and Will have might actually be the real deal. And The Fine Brain by Lauren Asher, a first book in Dreamland Billionaire series, a workplace romance between Rowan, a super wealthy, a somewhat emotionless CEO, and Zahra, a young woman who finally lands her dream job. As Rowan knows that this fling can't really happen, he starts texting Zahra using an alias and hoping that she will not figure it all out. Now, if I would have to review these four books using one sentence only, they all could be described as storyline kind of stupid and completely unrealistic, but it was hot so do without what you will. Let's proceed with two books that I picked for smut and state for the plot. Birthday Girl by Penelope Douglas and Priest by Sarah Simone. So I read the premise of Birthday Girl at least three times. I've picked up the book, I've read the premise, I've put it down. Having hots for a boyfriend's father who is also almost 20 years older than our main protagonist, as well as our main protagonist being just 19, for the longest time felt like a bridge I just wasn't ready to cross. 
and then one day I stumbled upon this book while in a weird mood and I honestly don't regret reading this novel in the slightest. Yes, the smut was there and the smut was good, but I can honestly say that I got invested in lives of Jordan and Pike. Jordan is a very likable, self-sufficient protagonist, while Pike is a father who's truly torn between allowing himself to love his dream girl and not wanting to hurt his son. I mean, the book is no masterpiece, but it does have an intriguing subject matter, which was handled with more grace than I expected it to be. All that being said, Priest still takes the cake for the most taboo book I have read to date. Now that book is heavy on the smut, like really heavy. Yet unlike other books who count on their sex scenes to be their only selling point, I'm looking at you, Carnage, by the way. Priest also explores the topics of forbidden love and sacrifice. Tyler, the priest, is not a morally gray love interest. He can't even be defined as a bad guy. Throughout the book, we can see him struggle between his devotion to religion and his attraction to Poppy. Excessive sex scenes aside, Priest explores the absurdity of forced celibacy and how being a good priest and having attraction to someone are not mutually exclusive. Okay, now that we've wrapped up most of the books I have picked up to read solely because of smut, let's look at some of the romance standalone novels I got to read in 2022. Beauty and the Baller by Ilsa Madden Mills wasn't exactly bad, but it was boring and incredibly easily predictable. It is the first novel within the Strangers in Love duology, but the second one contains an accidental pregnancy, and for me that's reason enough to not rush to give it a try. Now Bad Apple by Ella Kennedy. Where Hollywood's most notorious bad boy falls for a young woman whose busy life consists of work, volunteer work, and college, and who absolutely does not have time for a relationship, especially with someone who comes with a lot of fame related complications. Put Me in Detention by Megan Quinn, where one drunken night ends with our main leads accidentally getting married, and while our main female lead wants to get an annulment and forget the wedding ever happened, her new hubby is determined to make this marriage work. And The Worst Best Man by Mia Sosa, where our main heroine Carolina is left at the altar on her wedding day, and in the unlucky turn of events, she ends up having to work on a career making or breaking project with her ex fiance's brother the same brother who encouraged the groom to not go through with the wedding. And while Carolina would like nothing more but to hate him, sparks, of course, fly. All these three books are exactly what you would expect from an average romance novel. Simple, clear-cut storyline and likable characters. These novels are comfort reads. You get what you ask for, no surprises there. They are great for the days when you want to relax and shut your brain off, but still feel like reading. They are fun, relatively clever and fairly spicy. Similar things can be said about Make It Sweet and Dear Enemy, both by Kristen Callahan and The Wedding Date by Jasmine Guillory. And yet, these three books, besides following the blueprint of the average romance novel, also stood out in my memory, mostly because they gave me the couples who click really well together. Trust me, I'm not exaggerating saying that Emma and Lucian from Make It Sweet made me swoon. And since I already had decently high expectations after reading The Wedding Date, I'm disappointed to say that I found Jasmine Skillery's While We Were Dating to be, well, that disappointing. A novel in which Ben is responsible for creating a marketing campaign featuring a lovely, beautiful, and beyond famous actress, Anna, started interestingly enough and became very stale very fast. Another disappointment last year came in the form of The American Roommate Experiment by Elena Armas. While objectively speaking, it wasn't any worse than your average romance novel, after reading The Spanish Love Deception, I expected Armas to deliver us something better. That being said, People We Meet on Vacation by Emily Henry, The Unhoneymooners by Christina Lauren, and From Lucum with Love uh, by Mariana Zapata were exactly what I expect a good romance novel to be. They were interesting, entertaining, they had amusing storylines and multidimensional characters. These are the romance novels that I feel safe enough recommending to people who like romance without taking my time to figure out what exact preferences when it comes to romance they have. Because these books are simply put a good time. And if you think that by now we're surely done talking about romance novels, you would be wrong. So pause this video if you need to, go get yourself some coffee. We're just getting started.
Now that we're done with the standalone romance novels, let's take a look at some of the series that I gave a chance to. Kane Brother series that consists of A Not So Meet Cute and So Not Meant To Be by Megan Quinn. I wouldn't be me if I wouldn't have read the second book first, obviously, and I'm glad that I did because I find it to be at least slightly better than its predecessor. A Not So Meet Cute revolves around Lottie, a young woman who has just lost her job and lives with her parents and is overall not in the best place financially. On a spur of a moment, she decides that marrying Rich would be an answer to all of her problems. And as soon as she decides that, she runs into Huxley, a dashing wealthy businessman in need of a fake fiancé. And the rest is history. So my problem with this novel is that a not so meet cute is ridiculous. Not funny, but ridiculous. The dialogue and the actions of the characters are cringy more often than not, and any scene that could have any emotional depth is just being played for laughs. And while this might be something that other readers enjoyed, it just wasn't something I do. Meanwhile, So Not Meant To Be is a story of Lottie's sister Kelsey and Huxley's brother JP. The premise of this book is even simpler. JP is a life of a party, a playboy that doesn't take anything seriously, and he has his eyes set on Kelsey. Kelsey, on the other hand, is a believer in true love, and for her, JP's attitude is nothing more than an annoyance. That is, until they both are being sent to San Francisco for a work assignment and forced to share an apartment. While this book is not a masterpiece either, I found it to be less annoying than a not so meet cute. There. That's it. That's literally the only reason why this book gets an extra star. Sue me. Talking about Megan Quinn in 2022, I have also had the pleasure of reading her Getting Lucky series, which weirdly enough became my favorite romance series of the year. Getting Lucky consists of The Second Chance, That Forever Girl, The Secret Crush, and That Swoony Feeling. Each of the four novels is dedicated to one of the Knightley brothers, and all of them are set in a small town known as Fort Snow, as well as features a reoccurring cast of characters. I know I will oversimplify this explanation, but all four novels are connected by one event. That event was a curse, which was put on the four brothers by a pissed off palm reader in New Orleans. Now, whether this curse is real or not is debatable. What isn't debatable is that the men believe it is. So the second chance, as the name implies, features the oldest brother who is struggling to move on after losing his wife a few years back. That Forever Girl features the second oldest brother who has been lucky enough to find his soulmate back in high school and who was also stupid enough to not only let her go but to also break her heart in the process, and who now has to deal with the fact that the love of his life is back in town. The Secret Crush features the second youngest brother who has a pretty serious fear of commitment and a massive crush on his best friend's sister. And That Swoony Feeling is about the youngest brother, the eternal romantic, who spends so much time in the dream world of his own creation that he forgets to stop and look at what is right in front of him. I honestly enjoyed all four of these books, though the second two are definitely on the weaker side compared to the first ones. If anything, I would say that if you'll decide to give just one of them a try, you should go with that forever girl. Overall, all four of them have such a feel-good vibe. They're simple enough, the characters are the type of people you want to root for, and the happily ever after is promised. Twisted series, on the other hand, well, let's just say that I could have lived for the rest of my life happily not knowing it existed. The Twisted series by Anna Hong comprises four novels. Twisted Love, where we get a story of Ava, a young college girl who falls in love with her emotionally unavailable best friend's brother, who of course is also a genius billionaire and very, very dangerous. Twisted Games, where we get a story of Bridget, a princess of a small European country who falls in love with her super broody and masculine bodyguard. Twisted Hate, where we get a story of Jules, a storm of a woman who falls for her best friend's brother, a man whom she cannot stand and who in return cannot stand her and Twisted Lies, where we get a story of Stella, an angelically beautiful woman inside and out who falls for the dangerous yet devastatingly attractive psychopath. Now, I'm not saying that the Twisted series is bad, I'm just saying that it's not good. It's satisfactory to so what it needs to be in order to go viral on TikTok, aka a semi-dark romance with a lot of smut and incredibly possessive men, but that's the only thing it really has going for it. Twisted Love, in my opinion, was the worst of the series, basically unreadable. 
I'm working on a video review for it right now. Twisted Games was more consistent and better written, yet mostly boring. Twisted Hate must have been my favorite of the series, though still very average, but at least it did a decent job creating a tension between our main leads and actually following through with uh, this enemies to lovers trope and not giving up on page 5. I'm looking at you, Mankart. The Twisted Hate, however, starts going downhill in the second part of the novel because it seems that all Twisted books must include a man who is subjectively a bit of a piece of shit and at least one murder. That brings me to Twisted Lies, probably the second best novel in the series. The storyline in this novel is stupid, the main characters are rarely likable, and the power the main male holds is somewhat cartoonish. But at least the leads have great chemistry, and that's already a big step up from Twisted Love. Okay, let's take a break from all these dangerous, psychotic, and super hot men and talk about a few series that have started that are a tad more realistic. So I bought the whole Wild Trilogy by K.A. Tucker on my Kindle right away because the premise of the first novel sounded intriguing and Amazon uh, at the time had some sort of a deal that made it cheaper to buy all three at once rather than one by one. However, juries are still out on whether I'll end up reading all three of these books. Uh, that's not because I didn't enjoy the simple wild. Quite the contrary, I liked it a lot. I even took a little break for crying towards the end of it. The Simple Wild is about a city girl, Kala, who travels to a small town in Alaska and hopes to reconnect with her estranged father, where she eventually finds herself torn between her desire to go back to her life in Toronto and her attraction to local Alaskan pilot. Now, I liked this book because it was very simple, very down to earth. It didn't need any trauma subplots, murders or stalkers or natural disasters or fake relationships or marriages just to be entertaining. It's a simple, heartfelt novel about people and their relationships. In addition to that, I found Kalas and Jonah's chemistry to be great, despite the fact that Jonah is a little rough around the edges. And while some readers might not be his fans, to me he just seemed like a man who said in his ways, which I can understand. So as I said, the characters are great, chemistry is great, plot is interesting, and the writing K.A. Tucker does transports you right into that beautiful wildness. So the reason why I'm not rushing to read the second and the third part is because I do not think that they were needed. If anything, I'm afraid that they might ruin the first novel in the series by adding unnecessary drama. If any of you did finish the whole Wild series, please be so kind and let me know if I should continue them or not. Now, Knock Them Out series by Lucy Score is something that I am sure I'm gonna continue reading. As of now, only the first novel, Things We Never Got Over, is out and Funny thing, I was awaiting this book for quite some time. The premise of it just sounded ridiculous. A runaway bride Naomi travels to a small town to help out her evil twin sister. Her sister, however, being evil and such, uh, steals her car and leaves her with an 11-year-old niece she didn't even knew she had. Meanwhile, Knox, a bad boy, no commitment kind of guy, sees all of that going down and for reasons unknown decides to help Naomi out. Like I said, it sounds ridiculous. For months, I would pick up this book, start reading the synopsis, remember that that's the one who seems like a stupid soap opera and put it back down on the shelf. Until one day I gave in. I bought it, I brought it home, and I thoroughly enjoyed it. Well, the ending was kind of stupid, but the novel itself was very entertaining and I would definitely recommend it to anyone who just wants to have a good time. Lastly, last year I also had a chance to start on the Brown Sister series by Talia Hibbert. As of now, I have only read the first part, Get a Life Chloe Brown, and it was lovely. It had some original ideas and a likable set of characters. It just wasn't that memorable, to be honest. There wasn't anything inherently bad with it, it's just not my first choice for a series to continue. All that being said, now let's take a moment and talk about my never-ending quest to find a reverse harem novel that doesn't suck. So one day, I come across Faking with Benefits by Lily Gold. This is a story of a young woman who is really hopeless when it comes to dating. Lucky for her, her neighbors, three dashing young men, are self-proclaimed dating experts as they do have a podcast where they answer all dating-related questions. And now they set out to teach Lila how to date. I was in a weird mood, so I picked it up to read, and despite me having to completely shut off my common sense, I have to say that I found this novel to be entertaining. It was stupid as hell, but it was also a good time. Reading Faking with Benefits was a hundred times better experience than reading Carnage or Den of Vipers. 
And since I did enjoy this novel well enough, I checked out what else Lily Gold has to offer. And apparently she has released multiple reverse harem novels, so I obviously had to read them all. However, quickly enough I realized that all of Lily Gold's books are the same book that is just set in a different place and a different set of circumstances push our main characters to start this relationship. Nanny for Neighbors is the same as Faking with Benefits, but our main leading lady is a nanny and our three leading men end up with a baby on their doorstep. Triple Duty Bodyguards is the same as Faking with Benefits, but our main leading lady is a world-class celebrity who is currently dealing with a stalker and our three leading men are her bodyguards tasked with keeping her safe. Three Swedish Mountain Men is the same as Faking with Benefits, but our main leading lady is running away from her past and ends up in the middle of nowhere while our three leading men are kind enough to take her into their humble house. Now if you want to follow my lead and read all four of these books, then go ahead. But honestly, after I finish them all, I can say that a much smarter choice would be just to figure out which of these scenarios seem the most intriguing to you and forget the rest. As for Reverse Harem, last year I was also recommended to check out a fantasy Reverse Harem story called Pack Darling by Lola Rock, which consists of two novels by the same name. And I want to just point out how grateful I am for this recommendation, because the first book in the Pack Darling series has to be the best Reverse Harem book I have read to date. The main issue I tend to have with Reverse Harem novels is that everything is usually overly sexualized. There's no actual story, no character development, no originality. The plot in these novels is usually just something used to connect the never-ending sex scenes. In fact, Darling, however, plot matters and characters do too. As I've said, this is a fantasy novel, so it is set in a world where werewolf packs exist out in the open and where they have whole social systems put in place, making their lives easier. The story is a little difficult to summarize, but to make it as simple as possible, we follow a pack of alpha wolves, werewolves, it's never really defined, but that's just what I assumed. <laughs> so we follow them while they are being forced to take an omega into their pack. Omegas are the heart of a pack, though not any pack can afford to have one as they are so rare. Our main female lead is an Omega who doesn't want a pack, and our main male leads are a pack who doesn't want an Omega, as they already have one. Yet none of this is about what they want, it's about what they have to do. Yeah, I guess my explanation just made you even more confused, but trust me, if you are into fantasy and if you want to check out something a little more different within the reverse harem category, then give Pack Darling a try. Truth be told, I found the second novel in the series to be significantly weaker than the first one, but you can only get the full story by reading them both. So before we start wrapping the romance part of this video up, let's look at a couple of authors that were especially dominant in my read list last year. Colleen Hoover and Tessa Bailey. I didn't even realize until I sat down to make this video, but last year I read a total of 13 books by Colleen Hoover. So let's make this easier on ourselves and let's divide them into three categories. First being the novels I didn't particularly care about, the second one being good romance books but nothing particularly special or original, and the third category being the ones I have truly really enjoyed. Let's start with Without Married and Finding Cinderella, my least favorite ones. Without Married might just be my least favorite Colleen Hoover book to date. The topics discussed in the novel are objectively speaking interesting, but none of the characters are even remotely likable. And Finding Cinderella could have been really entertaining, but as it was compressed into a short story, a lot was lost and a lot was rushed. My favorites of Colleen Hoover that I've read last year have to be Ugly Love, Verity, which I know is technically a thriller, but there is plenty of romance in there too, so in my mind Verity goes into romance category as well. All Your Perfects, Hardbones, hopeless and reminders of him. If you are a fan of romance novels, every one of these novels I just mentioned should be a pleasure to read. None of them shy from difficult topics, all of them are filled with lots and lots of emotion and are very easily bingeable. Lastly, we have novels that are neither very good nor very disappointing. And in this category we have Losing Hope, for giving me the POV I so desperately wanted to read from, yet for not giving me the same emotional roller coaster Hopeless took me on. It starts with us, 
for giving me a closure I didn't know I needed, yet for feeling more like a fan service and not an actual well thought through novel. Confess for being heartwarming and entertaining and sad, yet for dealing with the main threats to our heroine in the lazest way possible. Regretting you for being heavily packed with drama and for introducing both Jonah and Miller into my life, yet for making every conflict of the novel to be driven by miscommunication trope, and maybe someday for giving me a glance into a life of falling for someone with a disability, yet for writing a sequel, which I'm gonna avoid reading for as long as I can, because I truly believe that maybe someday ended exactly where it needed to end. When it comes to Tessa Bailey, I know that I came very late to the party as I've only discovered her books last year by reading It Happened One Summer, but I liked it instantly and I liked it a lot. It contained pretty much everything I look for in a rom-com style romance novel. I have made a full review on this book so you can check it out if you are interested. It happened one summer threw me into Tessa Bailey wormhole. Right after I was done with it, I had to grab hook, line, and sinker. Bellinger's sister's duology tells us a story of two fairly wealthy sisters who, for their individual reasons, end up in a small fishing town. The first novel follows Piper, a real city girl, falling in love with a grumpy fisherman, and the second novel follows Hannah, who falls in love with her carefree heartbreaker friend Fox. Honestly, I can't really tell you which one of these two were better. They both have entertaining plot lines, interesting characters, and steamy romance. They both are definitely worth checking out if you are looking for a feel-good romance novel. So after finishing Bellinger Sisters' duology, I felt like giving a try to some of the older Tessa Bailey's works and stumbled upon the Hot and Hammered series. I picked up the first novel, Fix Her Up, and I ended up rather disappointed. Fix Her Up is about a young woman named Georgie who decides that she needs to get her life in order, and so she proceeds doing that by getting serious about her work, changing her wardrobe, and finally letting go of her crush on her brother's best friend, ex-baseball player Travis. However, instead of following through with this last point, Georgie instead proposes to him the idea of fake dating, a mutually beneficial deal which would help Georgie to show to her family that she's not a child anymore, and it would help Travis to get rid of all the women who still follow him around, reminding him of his glory days. And would you believe it? Travis actually starts falling for Georgie. Now, as I've already said, I wasn't a fan of this book. It wasn't even anything specific that I had issues with, it was just boring. And Georgie didn't work for me as a character. So after reading Fix Her Up, I really thought that I will take a break from Tessa Bailey until I realized that the third novel in Hot and Hammered series, Tools of Engagement, features a couple in which the female lead is few years older than her love interest. And since I find this so rarely to be the case, I just had to give it a try. And while it wasn't as good as the Bellinger Sisters duology, this one was definitely better than Fix Her Up. Tools of Engagement plot is also pretty simple. It's about a woman named Bethany who is competing with her older brother on who could do a better job flipping a house, and who falls for Wes, a construction worker helping her out with the project. Someone whose flirty advances she finds incredibly annoying, yet someone she has to count on if she wants to have a chance of winning this bet. As I've already said, this novel wasn't a masterpiece by any means, but Bethany's relationship with Wes was pretty damn adorable. And I've actually finished last year with uh, Tessa's Christmas novel, Window Shopping. Now, Window Shopping is about a young woman who suddenly gets an opportunity to prove herself at her dream job, just to realize that she has the hots for her boss. This one was a bit of a mixed bag for me. I guess what I've been trying to say this past couple of minutes is that I'm still not sure if I'm a fan of Tessa Bailey or not. I know I'm a fan of Bellinger's sisters, but as for Tessa Bailey herself, I guess only time will show. Now, before we wrap up the romance category and talk about my favorite romance novels I've read last year, let's take a moment and talk about Homefront by Kristen Hanna. I have struggled a lot to find a category or a spot within this category that I could place Homefront in, because this novel is such a different read than any other romance novels on this list. Homefront tells us a story about a woman who is a wife and a mother and also a soldier. 
Jolene struggles daily trying to make sure that every part of her life is taken care of, yet who can't help but see her relationship with her husband crumble in front of her eyes. And the moment the word divorce is being spoken out loud, Jolene ends up being deployed to war. Homefront is a wonderful, heartbreaking story of love, loss, and family. It made me angry, it made me sad, and it made me hopeful as well. It's one of these books that I know I will be recommending to people for a long while to come. And so let's finally wrap up the romance novels with the best ones I have read last year. The Kiss Quotient by Helen Hong was something that I grabbed from the library knowing nothing about and ended up being very pleasantly surprised. This novel is about Stella, a brilliantly intelligent woman who for a variety of reasons is very inexperienced when it comes to dating. In order to get better at it, Stella decides that she needs the help of a professional and hires an escort named Michael. Now when I read this description, I expected this book to give me a spicy story that I will quickly read and forget but instead I got a very interesting set of characters and a very unusual dynamic between them. What's even better is that I think that The Kiss Quotient was the first romance novel that I have personally read that features a main character who has an autism spectrum disorder. And I found this uh, different perspective to be captivating to read about. Say You Still Love Me by K.A. Tucker is such a cheesy feel-good story. The novel is divided into two timelines. When reading about our main character's past, we learn that during their teenage years, Piper and Kyle have fallen for each other badly. Yet we also learn that something horrible happened that pushed them out of each other's lives. Now Piper is a VP in a real estate development firm, and Kyle has just been hired as the new security guard for the company. Say You Still Love Me is a perfect example on how to do second chance romance. It's fun, it's interesting, and it features two adorable characters who just crave to be in each other's lives. The Wall of Winnipeg and Me by Mariana Zapata is one of the best slow burns romances I've read in a while. The storyline of it is rather ridiculous. Vanessa used to be a personal assistant to a world famous athlete who's also a bit of an ass. However, as soon as she quits and frees herself from all the burdens that comes with having Aiden in her life, he marches right back in it to ask for a favor that is incredibly outrageous and could also be life-changing. I thoroughly enjoy this novel because it takes its time to establish both Vanessa and Aiden as individuals. It takes the time needed to establish their friendship, to make you understand how difficult that road from enemies to friends to lovers can actually be. It completely sucks you into the story. Two of the Colleen Hoover novels that I've shortly mentioned before made this list as well, Reminders of Him and Hopeless. Reminders of Him does a perfect job at pulling at your heartstrings, telling you a story of a woman who's willing to do anything to be in her child's life again. And Hopeless surprised me with the biggest plot twist I've read last year. Like most of Colleen Hoover's books, these two are also very easy to read. It features interesting plot lines, swoon-worthy love interests, and a lot a lot of heartache. Last, we have my favorite romance novel of 2022, Book Lovers by Emily Henry. As of now, I have had a pleasure of reading three of Emily Henry novels, and all of them were wonderful in their own right. Book Lovers, however, was a perfect read for anyone who reads a lot of romance, and it's very familiar with all the tropes and stereotypes that comes with it. In Book Lovers, Emily takes Nora, who is not your typical romance heroine, pairs her up with Charlie, who is not your typical leading man either, puts them both into a small town, that they hate and lets us enjoy the way they decide to navigate the situation that rapidly spins out of control. Book Lovers is such an entertaining read, and I strongly believe that if you are interested in romance novels, then this one is a must for you. So let's proceed to our next category and briefly discuss the young adult novels I have read in 2022. The Bunker Diary by Kevin Brooks left me speechless. Honestly, at times I wasn't even sure how in the world is this book considered to be young adult, because honestly, it's pretty brutal. In the Bunker Diaries, we follow a young boy who was kidnapped and is being held in an underground bunker, with the security cameras observing his every move. The Bunker Diary left me heartbroken and desperate for answers. It's a short book that tells a big story and leaves a lot of space for interpretation. The Summer I Turned Pretty by Jenny Han 
on the other hand might just be one of the worst novels I have read last year in any genre. And as you know it very well by now, I have read a lot of trash. I found this novel to be so irritating and so boring that I'm quite sure that I would not have managed to finish it if I wouldn't have used it as a way to kill the time on my way to lectures. I have made a whole rant video about this novel already, but if I would have to sum it up for you here, then I just say that the main character, Belly, is incredibly selfish and borderline obnoxious, the love square is just ridiculous, and the plot is non-existent. And I know that this is just the first book in the summer trilogy, but I just can't force myself to read the sequels. When talking about young adult novels that I found disappointing, I also have to mention All This Time by Mickey Dautry and Rachel Lippincott. While it's not nearly as bad as The Summer I Turned Pretty, it's predictable and boring. It it tries really hard to be deep, to follow in the footsteps uh, of novels such as The Fault in Our Stars or Looking for Alaska, yet failing to give us characters worth rooting for. All This Time is a book that you'll read in a day and then forget as soon as you put it back on the shelf. Lastly in this category we have A Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson. This is the only book in the young adult category that I felt that I would have personally enjoyed much more if I would have read it 10, 15 years ago. A Good Girl's Guide to Murder has a very intriguing premise, as it follows a young girl who is trying to figure out if the person who was blamed for a murder of a local girl was actually the killer. It has multidimensional characters, great pacing, and relatively high stakes. I just couldn't enjoy this novel the way I thought I would because the writing style of Holly Jackson was very obviously targeted to the younger audience, and that doesn't really include me. And so let's talk about the few books that could be put under the magical realism genre. A Monster Calls by Patrick Ness can be easily identified as a young adult novel, or horror, or fantasy novel, but for me this book just screams magical realism. A Monster Calls tells us a story of a 13-year-old boy uh, named Connor, and ever since his mother fell ill, Connor has one and the same nightmare every single night. One night, however, something different happens. Connor wakes up just to find a monster calling his name. I love this book. It's incredibly easy to read and it's only a bit over 200 pages long, so you do not need more than a few hours to read it, and it's so beautifully written. It's a fairy tale. It's a book you want to read to just be able to retell it to someone else. Even if it's been years since you stopped identifying yourself as a young adult, A Monster Calls is still something I am sure you'd find delightful to read. The Midnight Library by Matt Keg is another great example of a book that's simply beautiful. In it we follow a young woman who ends up in a library, a magical place between life and death where she is given an opportunity to see how her life would have turned out if she would have made different choices. The Midnight Library is the type of a novel that touches your heartstrings and assures you that it is okay to feel lost. The Keeper of Lost Things by Ruth Hogan, however, was not my cup of tea. It tells us a story of a man who's lost something important and consequently dedicated his life collecting the objects other people have lost. After his passing, his personal assistant is tasked with continuing his work and reuniting people with their lost possessions. While well written, to me it felt like this novel didn't have a beginning uh, or coherent story or a satisfying end. I didn't develop an emotional connection with any of the characters presented in the book, and the magic aspect of the novel, in my opinion, was incorporated rather poorly as well. As for historical fantasy, last year I read only two books that could fall under this category. The Familiars by Stacey Halls and Soviet Milk by Nora Ekstena. The Familiars is set in 1612 and it tells us a story of a young noblewoman named Fleetwood. Fleetwood is with child and all of her previous pregnancies have ended in tragic miscarriages. Being afraid of the same thing happening this time as well, Fleetwood employs a local girl Alice as her midwife. Soon after, however, Fleetwood's hopes of surviving this pregnancy crashes as Alice is being accused of being a witch. The Familiars is an engaging story that explores the witch hunt craze and women's rights in the early 17th century. This book is easy to read and at times it makes your blood boil with anger. The only thing that this novel could have done better is the ending. The ending to me just felt rather nonsensical and significantly weaker than the rest of the book. 
but that's just a personal preference. Soviet Milk, on the other hand, is a novel that I'm not sure everybody would enjoy. The book is set in Latvia in the late 20th century, back when Latvia was occupied by the Soviet Union, and it's dark and depressing, and reading it takes a toll on you. The reason why I followed through with it was because I was born and raised in Lithuania, which was also occupied by the Soviet Union until 1990s, and so the story being told in Soviet Milk hit close to home. People who are not familiar with what happened in this time in history, or who do not have any personal attachment to it, however, I doubt would find this novel riveting. Now, every year I try to educate myself and read at least one classic novel. I feel like a lot of people have issues reading the greats because they were forced to read them and overanalyze them back in high school to the point where even looking at a classic novel gives them the shivers and I'm not an exception. Last year, however, I finally took the time to read the two big ones, important ones, Pride and Prejudice by Jane Austen and The Great Gatsby by Francis Scott Fitzgerald. Now, while I do understand the historical significance these both novels hold, I'm just not a fan of period dramas. I was reading Pride and Prejudice and all I could think about was just how little I care about all these snobby people and how much more interesting it would have been to read about said snobby people from the perspectives of their household staff. Now, these people have real problems and real hardships. Meanwhile, reading The Great Gatsby, I just struggle to stay awake. I know, I know, me not appreciating this classic masterpieces as much as I should makes a lot of people angry, but what can I say, they are just not my cup of tea. Last genre I wanted to explore with you in this video is nonfiction, and truth be told, I do not like reading nonfiction. I can pick up and enjoy books from basically any genre, but nonfiction is always something that I need to force myself to read, and that's probably because I see books as a form of escapism. But this year, the nonfiction books I picked to read were actually quite entertaining. Norse Mythology by Neil Gaiman is exactly what the title explains it to be. It's a collection of Norse myths and stories that have been passed along for generations. And I think it's a great read, as learning these stories gives one an interesting insight into how people back in the day used to perceive the gods, the universe, and all the natural occurrences around them. Tete and Nordmen, or These are Norwegians by Javad el -Bakar, is a humorous exploration of the author's experiences growing up in Norway. The novel is simple, easy to read, and entertaining enough, but since you can only read it if you understand Norwegian language, I will not spend any more time on it. Misogyny, The World's Oldest Prejudice by Jack Holland might have been the most brutal book I read last year. As the title implies, it explores the history of misogyny, and while it might not be the most thorough exploration of it, for a person like me who never did any actual investigation into the topic, it felt like a great starting point for any further research. And lastly, we have Friends, Lovers, and The Big Terrible Thing by Matthew Perry. Now, I grew up with Friends. I rewatched Friends more times than I can count, and I knew that I would be reading this book as soon as it came out. And I was not disappointed in the least. To me, it felt like Matthew Perry wrote this book without any intention of being perceived as a victim of circumstance or even as a good guy. He lays down all the nasty details of his addiction and tells us about the people he lied to, cheated on, and hurt throughout the years. I found this book to be raw and gritty and one of my favorites of 2022. So here it is, guys, the 100 books I've read last year. Thanks for checking out this video, and I hope I see you again, and I hope you enjoy your reading in 2023.